Hi, everybody. My name is Jackson Pino. I am Minneapolis Area Realtors Public Affairs Manager, and I'm going to bring you through our residential market update for February of 2024. We're going to go through a quick agenda for you all, just so that way you can get the landscape of what we're going to be talking about. We're, of course, going to start things off with our monthly housing charts, dive into some market segmentation, just so that way we can get a taste of that in the new year. And with new you, new news in the uh, in the new year, we have a, a bit of talk about inflation and what the Federal Reserve is going to do. I figured we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, we'll uh, then zoom back out into uh, looking at the wider housing market um, and some factors we want to keep in mind as we go through 2024. And then if we have any time left, we'll answer some questions. Sound good? Great. So, you know how we all like to start things off with some sort of motivational quote, something to put in context for all the work that we do here. And I thought, no better time to bring up uh, a founding member, uh, actually, of real estate in certain ways than Booker T. Washington, uh, because it is uh, Black History Month, after all. Um, if you don't already know, Booker T. Washington was an American educator, author, orator, and between uh, 1890 and 1915, Washington was seen as a primary leader in the African-American community, community uh, debating with the perspectives of W.B. Du Bois on how best Black people should achieve equality. Uh, Washington was a key proponent of African-American businesses and was a founding member of the National uh, Negro Business League. And that is relevant to our work here as realtors because the NBL in many ways contributed to the establishment of NAREB, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, uh, when two local all-black real estate boards were established in 1920, uh, both of which came out of the NBL shortly after Booker T. Washington's death. Um, and he has many quotes attributed to him, but one that surely leaves an impact here is one constructive effort in the way of progress does more to blot out discrimination than all whinings in the world. Uh, particularly an impactful uh, point of view that he had in history. Uh, we don't need to dive into that. I know you're all are curious about market stats, but let's let's remember that idea of a one constructive effort. Now he's talking about discrimination here, and that's important. But we could talk about one constructive effort to make sure that you're improving your business, that you're providing more knowledge to your clients. And I want to focus on that idea of intentional efforts to better yourself, better the world around you. Um, Booker T. Washington was all about self-improvement at the core of a lot of his ethos. So let's dive into that idea of self-improvement through our market updates. And talking about self-improvement, this was a uh, a web page that I pulled from Visual Capitalist. The link is in our notes. When I share these slides, you'll be able to follow this link. Um, and we want to talk about recovery more and more as we get out of the pandemic and that recession that we had. We are in a recovery phase now. The big question is, what sort of recovery is it going to be? And you will see these similar uh, shapes throughout a lot of the charts that we look at. We just haven't called them recovery curves. Uh, you can see an L-shaped curve looks like there's a dip and doesn't really recover, right? A U-shaped curve is kind of more expected. It's kind of the norm where a sharp decline and then a slow gradual increase. A W-shaped curve looks like you're about to rebound pretty quickly, and then you might have a setback before you fully recover. And then a V-shape recovery is probably the one everyone wants to have is quick decline, quick increase back to what you were expected to have, and you are recovered, right? We're all hoping for a V-shape recovery. Um, as you can kind of see with this little note right here, that sort of duration usually happens within a calendar year. Um, and if you are more curious about this idea of what does a recovery look like from a grand economic standpoint, uh, there is a follow-up report below this chart in the link that uh, 
I won't belabor the point, but it looks like we're going to be looking towards a W-shaped recovery. We might see some setbacks in some areas. We might not. But let's keep that in mind as we're talking about January closed sales. This is the first month of 2024. So let's take everything with a grain of salt, right? We all know that the beginning of the first quarter is not usually the hottest real estate month of the year, right? Um, but when we're comparing all Januaries alike with one another, like we do in these charts, we can tease out some sort of uh, ideas of what we could possibly see for the continuing months, right? Um, and I will say we're going to have some cautious optimism here because, boy, have we been uh, not very optimistic for the past year or so because of the dramatic uh, decreases in you know softening of buyer activity like you were seeing for these uh, two bar charts for 2023 and 2024, they're noticeably down compared to 2021 and 2022, right? But we are seeing slight increases. Uh, at the end of last month, there were uh, 2,100, almost 2,200 closed sales, 3% up from last year. That's positive news. And we want to see more of that as we continue on. And just in the same vein, Pending sales, which we all like to see as the potential for next month's closed sales, right, is even more so of a positive sign. It's 8% up from where January was last year. Uh, now, 2,800 admittedly is nowhere near the, you know, let's, let's grab our pen here, the, you know, kind of range of 2016 to 2020. Um, but we're getting there. You know, if we extend this line over, it's not too far off. That correction that we've been talking about, the idea that, you know, these sorts of years were a little too high, so you need to have an equal amount of correction, that's still the case here. That doesn't suddenly go away because we're in a new year. So again, cautious optimism. Yes, there is a kind of medium-term softening of buyer activity here, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know we aren't going to recover in a more, let's say, W-shape trajectory like we were first looking at. Let's flip the script here and talk about supply, new listings. Now, you can see here, just looking at the general trend of this, uh, January's new listings are particularly low in terms of supply, right? Ever since, you know, more than a decade ago, there really isn't a, a surge, so to speak, of people wanting to list their home on the marketplace. Now, we are up 18%. That's great, right? Almost 4,000 people decided to list their home on the MLS in January, um, bringing us back close to in line of 2021. That's good, right? But uh, I, I, can, I can hear you all right now, right? Uh, Yes, Jackson's trying to pump us full of optimism right now, but uh, the world may not feel exactly as uh, bubbly as I am, right? In fact, in many ways, the world right now looks like this, right? And you all are uh, saying, hey, does anybody want to buy a house? And And I don't want you all to feel that way, you know? I want you all to understand that the world isn't necessarily burning just because we have that hype, right? I love this, by the way, David. I uh, I took a few of your funny slides because, man, those are great. Wherever you found those, awesome. Um, but speaking of, you know, positivity, one of the, the real concerns that we had in about a year or so ago, 18 months ago, when the Federal Reserve was going to start, uh, you know, turning up the dial to uh, address inflation, um, we were concerned about uh, prices, home prices uh, devaluating in some sort of meaningful long-term way, right? I mean, that's that's a big concern we have because we know how important it is for long-term investment to uphold uh, the values of certain homes, the sales prices of homes, right? Um, and luckily, uh, it continues to be the case that we are seeing marginal increases, even at the heights uh, of you know highest interest rates that we've seen in a decade or more, 
uh, we are still seeing homes sell for marginally above what they were last year at this time. Median sales price, if you can't see it very clearly, $350,000 for the Twin Cities. That's up 2.3% from last year. And yes, it's not nearly the, to bring out my cursor again, the steady 6.5% increase that we're seeing here with my relatively straight line. It's, a, it's curved. You know, we're curving a little bit. They're diminishing returns, so to speak, right? But we will see that correction come back in line off into the future, ideally. That is supposed to be an arrow. Um, let's move on and take a look at not just my arrow drawings, but look at this from a marginal standpoint here, right? From uh, looking at the exact change in year-over-year -year median sales price. And what we were concerned about happened twice. Right here in this little circled area, we went negative for a few months last year, but we have been relatively positive. I would say at about 2.5% increase year over year um, for the past seven or eight months. That's good. That's predictable. And ideally, we will get back to you know this sort of trend of 5 to 6% that we were seeing in 2014 through 2019. Uh, now let's let's talk about expectations. Let's talk about uh, expectations of home prices in uh, an ever changing market. Right. Prior to the pandemic, we were talking uh, about uh, setting a let's say a negotiation, so to speak, in the percent of original list price received uh, at about ninety seven percent. Ninety seven percent meaning that. If someone listed their home for X, then at closing, they got 97% of whatever they ended up listing, right? And then when the pandemic hit, we got, even in January, mind you, close to 100% of original list price at the median. That's, that's unheard of, right? Particularly for more negotiation-friendly seasons, so to speak, if you want to even wager to try to... Uh, time the market in the winter like that. Um, but then we started coming back. We're coming back to this 96, 97% uh, equilibrium point that we were beforehand. Um, it's a changing of expectations, right? Some of you might have clients that are willing to sell or you know are listed on the MLS and they think they're still in this world, right? They think that they're still in the world that they can uh, they can ask whatever they want and there will be 17 people trying to bid on their home even though it hasn't been that way for over a year now. They kind of look like this. Yes, I know what all the comps say, but my house is special, right? Let's set expectations appropriately. Make sure that we have the data to be able to tell them that's not a realistic expectation if you want to have a timely uh you know sale of your home right now let's talk about timeliness so median cumulative days on market what's the shelf life for homes on the mls so to speak right prior to the pandemic we were at about in january 45 44 days on market and then pandemic hit, particularly for these years, 21 and 22, half that, half the shelf life that we were normally seeing. Homes were going off the market twice as fast in January. Crazy, right? Now we're starting to get back. Again, these corrections are happening again. You can kind of see the trend that we're seeing here that shows us that we are on the path to recovery, okay? I'm, I'm trying to make sure everybody feels the optimism as well as I do, you know? January inventory, what did it look like at the end of each given January, year after year? And now this is something that it is, this is more than just pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, what happened during the pandemic sort of stuff. Because the reality is that it, the low inventory wasn't just here. It wasn't just in 21 and 2022. I would argue it's still happening now. And in fact, it's probably been happening for about 10 years. 
We're, we're short on inventory. We all know this, right? This is something that we need to be advocating for. Uh, part of our government affairs initiatives uh, are making sure that we represent you all realtors make, uh, to stress the need for more inventory uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, so that way we have more homes to sell. These numbers go up. We have more clients, more opportunities for more people to get into homes, right? Win-win for everybody. Another great way to look at this, apart from just saying, you know, we ended the month with 6,300 homes on uh, on the MLS, which is, again, marginally up from last year, um, is looking at month supply of inventory, which I think is more intuitive and just acknowledging what the problem is, right? Because we reference five months supply of inventory like we had here in 2012 as a balanced market. And this is what I mean by saying we are below that threshold and we have been for years. This is more, this keeps me up at night a lot more than are we still in the midst of a recession? What's going on? Because this is a problem that has gone unsolved for 10 years. Um, yes, we are in a strong seller's market. And if that is uh, enough information for you to go off of to make a good business, more power to you. This is solid for anyone who's got sellers willing to sell. Boy, do they have the leverage, right? Um, but we're not maximizing the full potential that we could be. Um, and, and we should be doing that, right? Now, Let's ma let's take a moment to just dive into market segmentation here. Before we go into that, does anybody have any questions for me? You're welcome to throw them on in the chat, either about inventory, cumulative days on market, any of the funny memes that David and I make. I see one chat, just a howdy, and a not yet from Thomas. All right. Moving forward, you're all eager for the uh, the jump into our uh, our market segmentation. I get you. So new construction, we capture. I would like to say the vast majority, but not all, of new construction on the marketplace. Right. Um, so this is a again take it with a slightly bigger grain of salt than everything else we've been looking at, but it is a good indicator for us. Right. Um, what is the share of new construction uh, of all sales in the Twin Cities for the month of January? And you can see we have been on an upwards trajectory. Yes, we, we went down just prior to the pandemic, but we've been on that upwards trajectory for new construction as in terms of market share, not just total number of uh, new constructed units, right? But in terms of market share. A good reason for that being is because, like one of our first slides shows, there are just fewer sales overall. So the fact that these are new, fresh homes that, you know, have that warranty of a decade and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the shiny new thing on the block, right? Uh, they're, of course, going to take up a larger share when the uh, the buyer activity is starting to go down. 14% of all homes sold in January were new construction. That is up from 12% of all homes in January of 2023. Um, we have been watching this uh, keenly, and we'll keep an eye on understanding the, the factors of this. And if you are curious, we do have a few blogs on this uh, and uh, other market segmentation charts. Uh, feel free to jump into the chat and tell me if you want us to share you share with you those blogs. Uh, townhouse and condo market. I know some of you are uh, particularly focused on townhouse and condo real estate. So want to make sure that this is a uh, you know monthly chart that we're always looking at for you. And you can see where, uh, where everything else is can, you know, going up and down and there are noticeable changes. I do really appreciate the consistency of the townhouse condo market. Yes, it it did spike a little bit in 2023, right? Uh, especially when you're seeing 
Uh, your dollars in 2020 and 2021 couldn't go as far as they otherwise could because of increased interest rates. Well, I guess we will go for the condo, right? That's exactly what 2023 is right here at 27% of market share. And we have gone down a bit since. Now, in January of 2024, uh, townhouse and condos make up about a quarter of market share. The opposite of that would probably be the largest um, home you can find, right? There are many ways that we could try to uh, figure out, you know, home volume, square footage, right? Um, we chose to keep it simple here with uh, an indicator of plus four plus bedrooms, right? This is the share of all sales that had four plus bedrooms in the Twin Cities. And you can see in particular, we had a sudden surge of homes that uh, were sold with four plus bedrooms at the very onset of the pandemic, right? And then we started to even out. People all of a sudden didn't necessarily need that extra bedroom for uh, a webinar room, right? Um, this is gone fairly steady ever since then, evening out to be about 40% of market share. It dipped a little bit below that, but just barely, right? Um, fairly even across the board ever since that uh, spike in 2020. And another curiosity I know that uh, David has in particular, and I know a lot of you do as well, uh, is cash sales. Because there are more ways to uh, you know, dice up our market than just the way the properties look, right? It's how we finance those properties. Uh, and this is particularly interesting because in January, we are still seeing the percentage of all sales financed in cash above what they were in 2023, above what they were in 22, 21, and 20. That is five straight years of increased market share for cash financing in January, right? 18% of all homes sold in January were cash sales. Very interesting. And that also, you would think, you know, maybe those are just the mansions. That's true. Some of them are luxury. Absolutely. Um, but when you break it down by uh, single family, townhome, and condo, again, these are only cash sales, right? Of cash sales. This is not all homes sold on the market. This is of all cash sales now. You can see these numbers should add up to 100 here or just about. Um, 41% of them were condos. And then another 23, 24% were townhomes. And then 13% were single family homes, right? This tells us that it's not just the luxury because the luxury is happening here in the blue. But these are more affordable units, you know? The condos in particular are definitely something people can potentially finance with cash. All right. Wider economy. Let's take a quick time check. Now we are at about halfway through right now. Um, diving into the wider economy. And uh, I do want to start off with the first question that's probably on a lot of people's minds. Uh, what's the latest with inflation? You may have heard at the beginning of the year, Federal Reserve are going to have two to three uh, decreases in their interest rate. That's going to put more money into the economy. And then all of a sudden we hear, oh, uh, consumer price index is a way higher. Inflation is way higher than we expected it to be as late as last week, um, which was around 3%, I think, inflation. Um there's a lot going on, and the ideal here, right, the Federal Reserve wants a smooth and controlled return to normal, right? It's an easing of their interest rate hikes that doesn't cause a major market change. Um, and in order to make that smooth landing uh, happen, they're working kind of like Ted Stryker from the movie Airplane to try to get that to happen, right? 
it's not an easy thing, but we don't all see, you know, the effort that they're going through. Also love this movie growing up. Um, so what are they actually aiming for? What are they looking at? We've seen, I've showed you some charts in the past about, you know, uh, the relationship between the actual interest rate at the Fed and how that correlates to the mortgage interest rates. Um, I'm not going to show you those. I'm going to show you something slightly different here because it's more broad, more big picture. Um, the big thing that was in the news today was uh, the consumer price index, the CPI, and how it's not as low as what we thought it was going to be. And that's what you're seeing right here. The red line is the CPI, and you can see it peaked at about 9% right around here uh, in, let's say, January-ish of 2022. Um, and it has gone down ever since we had our height of the uh, interest rates from the Fed at their max. And what we're concerned about is that we've flatlined and we aren't continuing to go down more. That's the problem that everyone's talking about on CNBC and other places, right? What that looks like in this case is the yellow line is where the Fed wants to be at. They want to be at about 2%, give or take, uh, over uh, a 10-year period, right? And you can see, and I know it's probably hard to, to notice it here because stats aren't usually the prettiest as possible, but I'm creating a little box between, let's say, beginning of 2010 and just short of 2020. Um, that period, believe it or not, is exactly what the Federal Reserve is looking to have their consumer price index be at about. That was, on average, 1.8%, right around 2% inflated growth of the uh, inflation of uh, the dollar, of goods and services, all sorts of things, right? But that is not necessarily happening here. We aren't back down to that yellow line where the Federal Reserve wants them to be. What is one thing that is contributing to that? Now, in red, you have all items, the same chart we've been looking at for the past couple slides. I've also highlighted shelter here. By the definition of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, who actually made this chart, shelter includes residential real estate. And you can see one of the contributing factors in this red line is the purple line that you're seeing here. And it's gone up, but it hasn't necessarily gone down. So one of those things that is contributing to the consumer price index not being at that 2% goal that we have is housing is a scarce resource and people value housing. And it's higher than what the CPI overall is. This point, it's higher than this point. So it's pulling this point up. There are other things that are doing this as well. In fact, there's one more in particular that is doing this, but it's not on the CPI side. It's on the producer price index, the costs that the, uh, the material makers, right? We're not talking uh, like retail producers. We're talking like the places in... China or in the Midwest or in Brazil who actually produce the shirts that get sold at the retailers, right? What are they selling their products for? What are their costs? That's what the PPI is driving at. And you can see the PPI is right about at flat, but there is one thing in particular that is still holding it up. And this is something that we all care about. It is the idea of services, less trade, transportation, and warehousing. And I will put that in plain English for you all. That is labor costs. Labor costs are one of those few things that, because in the pandemic, uh, cost of living suddenly went up and employers rightfully said, you know, we need to give these people a pay raise because we need to keep our businesses afloat. What you're seeing right here is a kind of detailed drawing of that. This is Bureau of Labor Statistics wages and salaries for civilian workers. Um, and you can see that it's very similar to the other charts that we've uh, seen in the past. It's very similar to the um, housing chart that we saw. We peaked. 
and we haven't really come down as far as what an equilibrium would look like prior to the pandemic. So I'm giving you all this insight to say, yes, you know, me at the beginning of this presentation sounded really optimistic. And the last couple slides sounded like doom and gloom, right? The reality is the light is at the end of the tunnel. We are not out of the woods yet, right? There's still some work that needs to get done. Ted Stryker is still trying to land that plane, right? We got to work with that and be as knowledgeable as we possibly can about what our industry is doing, about emerging opportunities in the Twin Cities for real estate, um, and being creative with our own business practices to make sure that we're staying in the business. Because if you can make it through this business, and I'm confident you all can, um, you're going to be better for it and you're going to be successful in the next economic bull uh, season out of this, right? So let's take a look at the uh, housing market. We've got about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll leave some times for uh, questions. Um, I always like to start off this section about the greater U.S. housing market by looking at NAR's uh, most recently available uh, existing home report. Um, I will say, man, we were doing really well. Uh, Lawrence Yoon was publishing this the morning before each of these presentations, and I really enjoyed how quickly I could get this information out. Looks like at the start of the year, new year, uh, they're running a little bit slower. The January housing report is not going to be out until the 22nd. Um, so I'm giving you the December housing report numbers, which uh, in comparison to the you know gains that we were seeing relative to last year, you know, what we're in a much more sunny place than the numbers that we're seeing right now, even just being a month back, right? So what do the regions look like? Uh, the Northeast down about 10%, Midwest, us down about 11%. The South and the West are doing marginally better in terms of sales. These are closed pre-existing home sales, by the way. Uh, sales down for them only four and a half and two and a half percent respectively. Overall, the nation's uh, pre-existing residential real estate in terms of units sold is down only 6%. Um, in terms of housing report, and this is, mind you, December housing report, um, housing prices uh, are up in the Northeast by 9.5%, up in the Midwest by 6%, uh, up in uh, the South by, let's say, 4%, and 5% in the West at an average nationwide of, let's say, 4.5%. Um, our home prices are beating the average here uh, nationwide, uh, which is good, especially when it is below that 6% growth that we are expected to have here in the Twin Cities overall, right? Main takeaway from Chief Economist Lawrence Yoon from this report is that December's sales look to be the bottom before inevitably turning higher in the new year. That means we're getting back on track, so saith Lawrence, and I'm excited to see that future. But one thing that is going to have a big impact on that, as we've mentioned a few times already, is the average 30-year mortgage rate here uh, shown to you in the frame of the past 12 months by our good friends over at uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, they're saying that the average as of this week was around 6.6% .6 nationwide. And... Yes, that's certainly not where we were, you know, uh, months ago when we were at this, what, really low point of, uh, well, that was even 6.2 back in February uh, of last year. Uh, definitely not in the lowest points that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but let's keep in mind the relative scale. This is looking over the past 20 years now. Um, yeah, we were at a decades-long high here in this far-right red box, but we are going down from that, right? 
We're about where we were 2008, middle of the recession, and we are slowly going to be going down. Um, but I get that this is this is frustrating for people being at such a high uh, interest on their mortgage. And luckily, David made uh, a great uh, meme that uh, given the right client, you might be willing to uh, share this with them. Uh, the good old, I'm not paying 7% interest on a mortgage. Well, rent's 100%, right? Let's start talking about the uh, long-term benefits of home ownership, right? where even in a world where you're paying 7% interest on your mortgage, you're investing in long-term intergenerational wealth. And that is something that really best time to do that when? Yesterday, probably a decade ago. But second best time to do it, it's today, right? Let's take a look at those monthly payments while we're at it, right? Um, historically low rates and rising incomes had partially offset price gains, right? It had done that in the past because if you look, there's a bit of a curve here, right? And those of you who have seen me talk about this chart before, you probably know where I'm going with this. That curve was those price gains because if you take a straight line, you kind of connect these two points, that's a linear trajectory. That is something that realistically with the growth of our economy, linear trajectories are something that we anticipate um, with inflation, right? Um, and this whole area in between, you know, 2020, 2021, when people, the and by people, I mean the median uh, family was paying, let's say, $1,600, $1,700 a month on the median priced home here in the Twin Cities, they were making... That such they were having such a savings. And then all of a sudden we were correcting back up to this red line, this linear trajectory. And now we are coming back down from that. Why? Is it because of prices going down a little bit? No, home prices are the same. Interest rates. Interest rates are a huge driver of this. And because interest rates are coming down a little bit, the median family buying a median fan, a median priced home in the Twin Cities is paying a little bit less in their monthly principal interest taxes and insurance. So let's put that monthly payment in context, right? Because I just showed you a chart that was going up to the moon and then just went down a little bit and I sound happy about it, right? That's because in the context of cost of living, right? Now those numbers aren't just dollar signs. It is a share of that median family's income. This all makes a little bit more sense, right? Same thing, same chart, same crudely drawn red line. Um, deal of a century in X right here. We went up to the peak. And what's that peak? 26% of the family, the median family's income. Now, the Department of Housing and Urban Development classifies uh, 30% of income at gross is uh, should be spent on housing in order for that housing to be called affordable. We've been under that line this entire time. That's good. That is a promising thing for us here in the Twin Cities. And in fact, if you look at a map of this, the percentage of median household income spent on mortgage payments... We are not California or Hawaii or even Colorado, Florida, or New York for that matter. You're seeing, you know, spikes of above 50%, almost 60% of an income spent on a mortgage. That's not affordable housing. We're right in the light gray area. That's not bad. That's a pretty good place to be. And now Again, talking more about expectations, right? Let's take that idea of we're in a fairly good place in terms of relative cost of living versus, uh, versus uh, general incomes in this area, right? And let's focus here. This is NAR's report on the median age of home buyers, and particularly 
Let's talk about first-time home buyers, the people who are who are not homeowners yet, right? But they know how important it is for home ownership to be part of their long-term financial success because they've heard how important it is to have that intergenerational wealth, right? These people get it. The the repeat home buyers at median age is of 58, 59, right? First time home buyers are at a, a you know height of 36, 35, right? Now, this is an interesting chart on its own, but I bring it up for a particular reason, right? Because that's millennial age. Around, what, 30 to 40-ish, right? And when millennials were polled by apartment list, um, the number one issue that they had about the affordability of of owning a home, um, I cannot afford to buy a home. You know, why do you expect always rent? I cannot afford to buy a home. Now that's that's always been the highest thing. 2018, 69%. 2022, it went up to 74%. All these other examples, the flexibility that renting provides, that went down in share of responses. I prefer to avoid home maintenance and added costs. That went down. I think buying a home is financially risky. That went down. But the idea that I can't afford to buy a home is the only thing that's gone up in that period of time, right? So this has led millennials to just bet on the idea of the collapse. Come on, collapse. I know you've all seen this in social media, right? Now, this is my challenge to you all on uh, this webinar. Most agents know what's happening and by attending these sorts of things you do, right? Good agents understand what's happening. And there's a difference, right? There's a difference between just being able to pare it back, the things that we're talking about, and actually having an intrinsic understanding. And it's an even more important thing. Great agents can explain what's happening. And I challenge you all to be the great agents that I know you can be and explain these types of benefits to those potential first-time home buyers that we all have connections with, right? Explain how uh, the total home sales, right, are expected to, yeah, they went down, but they're expected to bottom out and come back out. There will be more buyer activity. There will be more opportunities to buy. Existing home sales up 13%, so says NAR. Forecasted with NAR and HUD. Two very uh, legitimate uh, insights into this. And they're not alone, right? Uh, Q4 HPES uh, shows long-time forecasting of estimated home price performance being up. 2.4% next year, 2.7% 2025, and we're getting back into the swing of things throughout 26, 27, 28. That's good. These are things we need to be celebrating. This is why I'm optimistic, right? Home price forecast for 2023 and 2024. Now, this little, these next two ones are confusing because they're showing things you know, at two, two different points of time that they're measuring this, right? Um, but we're talking about the idea um, that the average of all these forecasts of home prices, um, we, we were fairly optimistic for 2023 to be up, you know, 6.7%, says Fannie Mae, 1.5%, says MBA, marginally NAR, right? NAR is more conservative of these three, right? But the averages of all of these, we're going to be up. First in 2023, uh, 2023, up, and they were about dead on. Again, 2024, we'll be up again. That's just home price forecast, right? Total home sales forecasted, we're up again. For Fannie Mae, MBA, and NAR, they're all up. 
And that is an indicator for us that we are, like I showed you, that tunnel, we're right at the edge of it. And we need to make sure that we're pushing through, we're staying in the business, and that we're encouraging the spread of this information and not dwelling on the fact that we had some rough months, right? Now, got about eight minutes left. Um, I am have the slide here just because... I often run late, but I am not out of time right now. I am more than happy to stick on and answer a few questions for everybody. Um, does anybody have questions for me? Um, at all. Let's see a note from Pete. Um, this was a few minutes ago. Oh, you're all good. Okay. Thanks, Pete. All right. Nobody has any questions for me. I'll stop screen sharing. I will leave this open. Um, Susan, you asked the question, do, do I see politics affecting the market? What politics? Are there politics going on? Are there politics happening in this country internationally, anything like that that might impact the market? Um, no, I kid. I mean, uh, the reality is we we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball completely on this, I'm sure, to some degree. But I will say, as someone who has a lot of experience engaged in both politics and housing market statistics, um, the things you see on breaking news of whatever your local cable channel is that you watch uh, – won't necessarily be the thing that drives market forces every single day. Uh, David has a great line uh, that says the, uh, what is it, David, is the stock market's like a voting booth. Uh, you can either say, yes, I approve in the economy, or no, I don't approve of what's going on in the economy. Um, but the long-term trend is what really is important. Don't pay too much attention to, you know, the impacts of the smaller, you know, political squabbles. And I don't mean to trivialize them as that, um, but I'm saying that in the context of they won't directly impact the housing market here in the Twin Cities unless they have real good reason to do so, if that makes sense. Um. Concerns about the amount of condos and rentals now being built. Um, so I will say, first off, big picture, no. We need more homes for people to live in. Um, we need to make sure that there are places where people can purchase homes, where they can uh, have stable housing, and generally that is good. Now, what does the ideal home look like for different people? That's a decision on market tastes, right? Um, I think we have this idea that everybody needs to be in a single family home. Um, and some people absolutely need that. I want to make sure that our industry has the resources capable of providing that to people who want that, right? But we also need to not make sure that we are sticking to a particular model of what we see as a home. And if trends are showing in the direction that people want condos, um, then we should meet where the market demands, right? Now, on the idea of rentals versus condos, because it's, it's in your uh, question as well, concerns about condos and rentals now being built, um, I think what you're seeing there is... Uh, a kind of hedging your bets um, dynamic from developers, right? They'll build a luxury rental. And um, if the person who ends up running that rental building at a luxury price uh, yeah. makes the financial decision later to turn it into condos, then they can, right? They're building mm -hmm. those luxury rentals specifically for that type of purpose, right? Um, but... Um, we need to make sure that, you know, being realtors, 
uh, that we are encouraging long-term home ownership if people want to buy that, right? We always have the option because we know that today's renter is tomorrow's next homeowner. And they got to have the availability for rentals and be in a place where they can go and seek you all out, right? Um, will we have the slides? Yes, of course you will have the slides. Um, I will send those out along with the recording of this video once it ends up on YouTube. And a thank you from Thomas. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. I won't hold you any longer. Thank you all so much for being with me. Um, if you do want to attend our next webinar, it is going to be same place. I kid, because, you know, it's virtual. Um, it is going to be same time. The monthly housing market update is March 21st at 2 p.m. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Yes, it will go out in email as well, but why not click on it right now? Get registered. That way you don't forget. You can see us next time. All right. Bye, everybody. I'll see you in March. And you have a good day.